All right, so can you introduce yourself? My name is Matthew Anderson. I'm the Director of Education for the North Dakota Museum of Art. Um, I've been doing this for about eight years. Um, I graduated with my MFA from the University of North Dakota in 2009. Um, I am uh, from North Dakota. I grew up in a very small town, middle, middle of the state um, called Gackle. Um, got my undergrad from uh, Northern State University in Aberdeen. Um, and then moved back and I've been up in Grand Forks for probably oh, going on what 15 years now. Cool. So you're mainly painting drawing as your medium, right? Yeah, I've uh, um, mainly, yeah, painting, drawing, um, primarily, you know, kind of 2D wall, wall work um, for my, when I was a graduate student, I worked a lot with uh, digital, digital drawing, but still kind of like viewed the, uh, um, you know, the digital tools, you know, computer, pen, tablet, um, you know, just the entire process still kind of through the lens of uh, traditional drawing practice. So in other words, it's still, it's still gonna, my, my finished pieces are viewed after they're printed out on paper, right? Um, so I have been experimenting recently with some digital drawings that are meant to be viewed only on a tablet or only on a computer. They're not meant to be printed out. And that, that does change a lot of um, kind of my thinking in, <laughs> in what artworks are going to look like is, you know, when I'm making digital, large digital drawings, I'm thinking about that outcome at the end, right? Is that how big is this thing going to be? I need to translate that from the screen I'm working on to, you know, four by eight feet. Right. But when I'm working on the tablet and, and it's never meant to, the image art is going to exist anywhere else, then that changes my thinking about it to just, it, it almost kind of, it allows me to loosen up a little bit because that is, it's, those are my parameters, the size of that screen. Um, and then I like to switch back, you know, go back and forth between digital work and um, more traditionally, you know, just drawing directly on. Material surface paper, watercolor paper, what have you, um, because it's, it, it's just more. It, it's just a different tactile experience, right? Drawing on paper and the drawing on the smooth tablet, but I don't think one is better than the other, or replaces the other, or there's any. You know, I get you know, I hear a lot of people you know talk about digital art like somehow it's cheating, like it's just different challenges yeah, it's just a different, different so, yeah it's just a fun tool but so uh, I, I do like exploring just different basically just all the different ways to draw you know um, is, is, is where my interest is cool yeah I'm curious um, I've never really tried digital drawing before but it's something I know a lot of like fellow students are interested in and want to get there eventually oh my dog's joining us sorry <laughs> <That's> <laughs> um, right uh so yeah he learned how to open the door so he just comes and goes places now um yeah so what are kind of the themes subject matter that you use in your work i know the bird um the adaption image we were looking at or i was talking about earlier um i read kind of your artist statement on that um kind of exploring human activity and like the enduring presence of the natural world i really like that um what are you kind of working on now? Because that was probably more from your MFA days, I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah, and those kind of, um, <clears throat> those, those MFA, you know, grad student days are, are it's a, there's a, it's a different kind of uh, focus um, and, uh, intent, especially making work while while a student, when I'm working towards deadlines and graduation, and um, being exposed to a lot of different art making practices um, while being a grad student. I mean, all of that influences that work as a really um, you know, intense experience uh, to be making work as a grad student. So after that, uh, being able to watch oh, you know, just kind of. Uh, step back out of that 
and uh, just have the freedom to explore um, on my own. Also, you know, I'm working at the uh, North Dakota Museum of Art has given me a lot of uh, just a, a tremendous amount of exposure to different uh, practicing artists who approach art making from all kinds of different backgrounds and philosophies and methods and making and <laughs> it uh, that that's really nice to see um so uh see so right like working like like as my grad student days i was focused on a lot on um uh, not so much environmental issues but kind of how um at the time how i was kind of piecing out how i was looking at um the natural environment through through a lot of different lenses um, and some of those are the lenses of you know, consumerism or you know, economy, place, you know, just big broad subjects and trying to hone all that down into like <laughs> any kind of specific imagery is really tough. Um, but now I've, uh, uh, I'm still very much interested in um, the local, but almost to the point where the local is, is, is becoming very personalized so it's this kind of blend between the you know, local and place and also my own self my and then and, and some identity work so oh. just you know looking at the landscape and not just the landscape i'm looking at my yard my place my experiences in this little eight acre farm that i have and just taking the time to just look at look through it just me like i'm not not too much thinking about my audience or 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 larger themes or things like that i'm just just looking at my own experience there and just kind of really, trying to yeah, try to dive that's, into that that's really interesting um has that like come about during COVID, or is this just the last couple of years because i suppose um i'd say the last uh it's, it's been a, that kind of art making experience, kind of making making pieces just directly out of my um, experience with my own environment, like, like using, you know, I'll still use you know, paper and material, but the what I paper material I'm using is is you know incorporate incorporating it within, uh, for example, rainstorm, set out some watercolors let that board get rained on for a couple of weeks and bring it back in to my studio and see just kind of how i'm going to respond to it with pen and ink <laughs> then bring it or you know bring in materials from outside there's really a lot of back and forth between what's just immediately there i'm doing less kind of traveling out so having that kind of more intimate art making experience covid really has affected the making experience too much uh, but it, it's definitely affected the ex the exhibition experience <laughs> I mean, yeah. there's not a lot of not a lot of like there's a lot of venues are shut down so there's not uh, you know there are a lot yeah. of places to to display work um also just you know collaborating with other artists too like conversations have shifted a lot you know i mean there's there's people that that are that art making experience used to be also maybe tied in more with a social experience or they they were used to collaborating and talking a lot with each other so everybody kind of pulling back and sitting in their own apartments and homes for yeah. some people it's been an extraordinarily isolating experience yeah it's hard because art it's something you don't really think about like because it's all oftentimes you are like by yourself or working on your own projects but even like as a student now um we just have a couple critiques a semester and that's that's all we interact with each other is kind of like how it's been. So yeah, that that communication aspect and that collaboration. Yeah, I definitely um, could see that um, as a as a big part. A lot of people could relate to. Um, yeah, so like uh, working at the museum, I guess probably was also you had some contact with other artists there too. I'm guessing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we have um, 
you're almost coming up on a year. Well, getting really close to when the, you know, the museum is an institution where we rely on, on people coming in. I mean, that's, that's been the point. I mean, to, I mean, to see, <laughs> I mean, there's to see, to, to experience art in person is, is that venue is through museums and galleries, right? So, you know, we can still um, get online, like the kind of, it seems like the whole world is kind of getting online and everything is, you know, even our communication now is done through Zoom and things like that. But there is nothing that can replace a conversation in person or experiencing art in person. So if yeah. we have to close our, close our doors, that is um, very destructive to our purpose. Um, so try to trying to adapt to that and, and stay relevant with the, to our community has been uh, challenging. Um, I'm very grateful that we have not like we we've been functioning this entire time, even when our doors have had to be had to be shut. Um, so we've had just basically part of it's been nice. We have to catch up on projects that have been on the on the back burner yeah. for years because they just start. Um, because that's where they were. So there, there, so there has been some benefits to being able to just not have to focus outwardly so much and take time to focus inward. Um, but uh, but in that, it's it's I'd, I'd say my professional um, life. There's been far more challenges there than in my in my personal life. Yeah, with your personal like work and stuff. Yeah. So um. Do you think like after restrictions start to lift and such, will people start coming back like in the numbers they were? Or do you think people are gonna get so used to that online? Oh, I'm just gonna look it up, look out their Instagram or whatnot. We had um, over the course of last, and I back a little bit further. I've been running uh, summer art camps, which is an in-person week-long art camps for kids. Um, that the museum started in 1997. Yeah, I think I've been um, here like I've been, when I was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, like I've been here eight years, right? So I've just, um, uh, my experience was um, keeping those camps going and then, and then growing them as they have. And prior to in 2019, uh, we had like we've like those camps. I watched them grow from six weeks to now fourteen weeks, and we're we're you know doubling up over the top of like we'll put two or three camps on top of each other. Uh, so watching that grow and seeing all those kids and families being involved with that art making experience and featuring local artists from Grand Forks who teach those camps, really focusing on the artists that are here and they teach those camps and it's it's a it's a community experience um last last summer we couldn't offer those was tough but the demand was still there so there's a lot of people still were kind of wondering what we were wondering what we we're going to do to keep that going and you know to meet meet the demand that's um to me that's really really important to to offer a solution so what I did, um, and I just used uh, the school system as an example and some other places in Minneapolis, some writing centers, and I just called around to see how other people were offering education experiences online. And I ended up using um, uh, Google Classroom to offer online art uh, education classes and uh, and, use, and working with some local artists and a lot of UND resources too. That The university is absolutely fantastic. They came in to the classroom space that normally we are, you know, we have 25 people and the kids in there in person plus six staff and myself and it's just busy and crazy and fun and, and those are art camps and I, you know, it's just a great time. And they converted that space into a, uh, a place where we could offer online classes. They put cameras in there and television monitors and we were ready to go and we offered those classes and in the middle of the summer, it, there was very little interest in oh. anybody signing up for those oh, no. virtual classes. And I 
totally understand it. Absolutely. Like I said, I think it was important to offer it, but it was also a good, I think, litmus test for where people are at with online experiences. And, and towards the end of the summer, uh, I worked with the uh, provost office um, and, the, and the safety office and oh, yeah, the unity facilities. And we managed to um, uh, be able to offer some in-person classes. We were outside and the classes are an hour long and limited to eight kids. It's a really small personal outdoor classes at the museum. Um, and after getting those permissions, putting those out to the public, those classes in just filled up. Oh, instantly. really? Okay. The kids want to meet in person. Their parents want their kids to be able to have that experience. Um, it's not, you can't, I mean, it's just, it's similar to my own drawing practice. That's like, you know, working on with pen and paper together is not, you can't mimic that by working on a tablet. They're mm -hmm. two different experiences. So just recognizing that these are different experiences, I think um, is valuable, but as you know, as far as the you know, meeting online, like I think it's very valuable. Like right now we're talking to Zoom. I think this is really valuable. There's advantages to that. I can be in my office. I don't need to set aside time. It's really easy and convenient for everybody just to find this time to meet. So I think there is something to be said for like Zoom meetings, online meetings going forward, you know, continuing, yeah. Post COVID, it'll it'll have its place, but it's not meant to replace. Yeah, it'll just have a place if that makes sense. So yeah, I, definitely. There's been like a a push towards um, engaging with technology that I feel like a lot of people were avoiding before COVID. <laughs> so I've kind of yeah. noticed that even like with my own parents, like they've kind of had to like learn Zoom and learn all these other things. Um, so yeah, so that's probably something that'll probably yeah continue um, going forward. Um, as far as like art um, in general, do you think like online exhibitions are gonna start like popping up a little more? Um, I know I've talked about social media and like kind of in past interviews, like kind of people have started to feel like a pressure to like lean in to the social media aspects of art, like sharing online. Have you um, felt that pressure at all? Um, you know, I think my response has, you know, to that has been making work that is meant to only be just, you know, viewed online. Yeah. You know, so, I'm, so I've got, you know, I have, an, uh, I have an iPad and I've got several different, you know, several different, um, I don't say drawing apps. I mean, they're, they're creative apps <laughs> that, that I use and uh, they're, uh, they're fun to use. What I'm finding is uh, especially apps like, uh, like Adobe Fresco or which I, I that's a nice one. Um, or procreate like a lot of people like that um, there are there's a lot of canned effects you can use and then you know fun brushes and you know just entertain you know, it, it's entertaining but then at, you know, after you get you know you kind of go through those brushes and see what they can do like there's there's it's it, it's still the practice of it is still treating it um you're not just showing off fancy brushes like what are you what are you what are you saying as an artist if you're choosing to display online and that's your choice um i think that there uh i'm working with several different artists who are working on sculpture projects that are going to be popping up this summer they're working on um exit we're, we're having an exhibition the museum has an exhibition coming up in march um for the uh the ceramicists so we're not i don't see uh, a lot of i'm gonna maybe i'm waiting to see i'm kind of skeptical about virtual exhibitions as far as um showing 
paintings or any artwork that's, that any artwork that's meant to be seen in person. Yeah, I'm skeptical what the the um, like I said. I don't think you can replace it. I think it'll be a way to like like if you want to show your gallery space virtually, that's awesome. Because that way people from around the world can kind of visit your space. And that will hopefully motivate them to visit you in person. I don't yeah. see that as replacing visiting you in person. I think it's a, like, as a motivator. Um, but that is kind of over here. Then there's also maybe this new area of really like getting used to technology and having online shows that are only meant to be viewed online and uh, exhibition venues maybe taking advantage of that. I'm, I'm curious to see how that's going to go and if there's any technology that's going to really allow people to have a total and like a complete exhibition experience all on a phone. Yeah. Right? Like, from from re reception to like viewing the show later to like it's going to close. Is there a way to take, take that in-person experience? Because the artwork, if it's meant to be viewed only online, then I think that that's that's going to be really interesting and in a way too like i can see it as a threat to institutions like the museum where we want people to come at our doors well what if this yeah. artwork is not meant to be viewed in in your institution it's meant to be viewed on a phone it's almost like like, like this, it's a similar conversation with in education like how much brick and mortar do we really need i mean if students can just go to school at home and receive a really high quality and effective learning experience in yeah. their own <laughs> home and with their own schedule, why do we need them? Why are we funding all of the resources to provide that brick and mortar, that that classroom experience, that in-person classroom experience? And like, with some areas, of course, that's that's extremely valuable, and I think art's one of them. Like, it's really like you need to see it. You need to be there. Like, yeah. there, there needs to be that in-person experience. But some like to maintain the facilities and. Uh, just just the, the what it takes to offer that in-person experience it's a lot of work a yeah, lot it'll of be, moving parts it'll be interesting so to can, see if tech is just like a like if it's an additive thing or like if it expands into its own realm um it'll be interesting i don't know yeah yeah, oh. I, we, yeah we've been homeschooling um uh, our kids for several years and they've last two years they've gone to public school and now my youngest daughter wants to move back over to homeschool because she has a wider variety of options for classes and subjects that she wants to take oh that's really i didn't so, even think like, about that yeah yeah because she like i mean we use khan academy and she has just it's just it's a different learning experience and it's it, it what i'm avoiding is i don't want i don't want to try to speak poorly about any any faculty or instructors like, a, like it's it's not that but if you can have a learning experience where you're watching some amazing videos on science and biology and they're engaging and they're captivating and there is something about teaching where um you have to be a, a, a performer when you're in yeah. front of a classroom, you have to perform and you have to make it engaging. And it, you, you know, even if you know, you know everything about it, if you're standing up there and you're just, you know, Bueller, <laughs> you know, like, if you're just bored, if you're not engaging, you can know, you can be an expert in your field, but teaching uh, part of that is, um, is, being an, is, is being an entertainer and how can you possibly compete as as faculty when you've got a company in tech with resources like Khan Academy or um, yeah. you know, other institutions where they can put on professional video posting and they can post product edit the heck out of that to make it just absolutely enthralling and it's like watching Discovery Channel all day and you've learned a tremendous amount of information and you feel jazzed up and excited about it and that's what my younger daughter misses about yeah. homeschooling is that she can choose like just a variety of subjects the endless um, amount of information out there and i guess then she could maybe even like you said with classes i'm i kind of wish i had that option even in high school to like kind of tailor what i mm -hmm. take more options of classes whereas mm -hmm. like when you're at a smaller school you get like 
like one type of art class, whereas online, I'm sure you could take drawing or painting or digital art and kind of explore more. It's very interesting. Yeah. So it's kind of hard to predict, but I know that, you know, this, the, the shift, I know it like the academic environment that, that there is this kind of nervous shifting being felt by a lot of, well, by everybody as far as um, online education. And now, well, the pandemic kind of forced, <laughs> like it, it forced everything to happen. So we'll see. I mean, it, there's just big shifts. Like I said, I don't think there's, a, it's, it's just, we'll, we'll find ways to integrate everything together because at, at, we're all gonna have to meet each other where, we, where we're at. I mean, yeah. you, you, you know, in fact, like institutions are going to have to meet students where they're at. And, yeah, and some people have just, really excelled in that the yeah, online environment. Absolutely. Some people haven't. So it's like you're going to absolutely probably, probably yeah. going to have to have yeah. uh, two options or more, you know, so it'll be interesting how that works out. Um, so I guess moving on from COVID. Um, so you've been in North Dakota. You're born here. Um, yeah. So you kind of have um, an idea of the environment, of course, and like kind of the culture being like very vast, unpopulated, um, flat. <laughs> so has that <laughs> environment kind of affected you um, in your art? I imagine so. Um, you yeah, know, that, that is part of uh, you know, a little bit of part of that, that current exploration is trying to figure out exactly that. Like, how has this environment affected my art making? Because I do tend to see a horizon line as a really straight, shallow line at the bottom of a picture plane, mm -hmm. because that's where I live. Yeah. <laughs> it's, or um, uh, it's uh, that you know, little horizon line is down there, but then there's just some magnificent freaking cottonwood tree, right? Because they stand up out of the middle of that flatness. And um, they grab my attention. Right? So, so in, in a, I, I yeah, I've never lived in a, a, a mountainous area where all the roads are curved and I'm down in a valley between two, you know, huge granite mountains with trees on both sides, like rising over the top of me. I've, visited those environments, but that, that doesn't feel familiar to me. Mm -hmm. So of course, this environment has affected me, but I'm just trying to figure out how as, and it's not so much, I guess, you know, how can you figure out how if you're not comparing to someplace else? So it is kind of how as compared to someplace else, but it's more of a way of, for me, a way of thinking. It's like, how has this environment affected the way I think? Do I think in black and white, left and right. We're all on this big grid up here. Like it's, you can't, it's so hard to get lost in North Dakota because just drive straight long enough and you hit a highway. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's um, I, I, I just sense that there is, um, that that has affected uh, just, just, you know, just I mean, all of me, the, the way I think, my personality, my sense of humor. I mean, growing up in the Midwest, I mean, you're right, there are a lot of people up here. We have an awfully dry sense of humor. Um, we, I mean, there's just some cultural practices, right? Like, uh, like nobody's going to take the last piece of food off a plate. We'll keep dividing it until there's like almost nothing left and nobody takes the last piece. I mean, this kind of... Uh, there is a culture up here that because I, I'm just a part of it and grew up in it, it's hard for me to see. Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm sure you know this. Like the long, you know, you work on a painting for long enough, you can't see it anymore. You, you just can't yeah. see it, and then so you need other people to come in and help you kind of look at it. Yeah, look at it. Yeah, yeah. Try kind of turn things around a little bit. And I suppose uh, it's probably a lifelong question, and I th hard I'd one to answer. So, yeah. But <laughs> yeah, it's always it's always interesting to see what um, kind of like pick out certain things that inspire you, like how you mentioned the horizon line being really long and um, towards the bottom. Yeah, like I've definitely 
seen that and then the cottonwoods yeah those are like our mountains like they're so like tall compared to other trees and they're they're definitely like an aspect that stands out um are there any other like um environmental things in north dakota that kind of inspire you or parts of the culture that you can think of i think the um uh, again yeah the, i think the landscape definitely it like um impacts you know can impact and define culture in a way i get i guess what i'm getting as i look i can see north dakota is really split down the middle i mean we got the the western part of the state which is uh, very dry and you know ranch land and oil and the landscape is much different i mean the the the, the, you know, the Medora, the badlands i mean that's it, it's it's gorgeous mm -hmm. but that is not the flat Red River Valley plains of eternal growth of, I mean, it's cropland over here. Like there's, yeah. there's, there's you know, nobody's running, you know, very few people are running livestock over here. Uh, on, You're on, from like the, the very, the merry middle of the state. What was it like in that yeah. area? What's that? So in the, in the south, so I assume the middle, but in the um, kind of southern middle part of the state. Um, so basically kind of south of Jamestown, maybe 45 miles. So it's, uh, so I grew up in a lot of gravel, it's scrubland, there's a lot of gravel down there. There's, so it's kind of a mix there, like people would be, um, they'd be grain, you know, do a lot of grain farming and that would offset their feed costs for their livestock. Um, so there's more like, a, if, like the farming community is, is a little bit more mixed. Um, they're not just focusing, you know, it's not like around here, like some people are just corn, soybeans. That's what they do. They rotate corn, soybeans, and potatoes. And then you go way over the other side of the state and they're, you know, they're just cattle. They're cattle or, you know, oil. Or, you yeah, know, then there's industries around that, right? So in the middle part of the state, it was a um, combination of both. And then I'd say we are, uh, where I grew up, there was a lot of, um, uh i mean hunting culture exists on both sides of the state but we there would be days out when duck season opened up the schools are just shut down really oh everybody gosh. went duck hunting and and then for the next week uh the you know kids including like in my class there'd just be groups of um yeah, I mean, it's, it's typically, you know, groups of guys, but, you know, it's these groups of guys that come in, there's five of them, and they're coming in two hours late every morning, and they come in in their orange camel gear, and they take it off, and their shotguns are in their truck, and they, it's just, they went duck hunting that morning, and uh -huh. it's, a, and it's, and it's an excused absence, is what I'm, <laughs> I guess. Oh, I'm my gosh. That. So, it's, a, um, yeah, it's very rural, and it's, a, I think that's maybe changed a little bit now. I don't, I don't think that's quite the same today, but um you know yeah i guess what 30 40 you know, 35 years ago when i was uh, 30 years ago in high school yeah that's that's what they were doing so that's that's my kind of growing up experience and then that really kind of rural small town um culture which still even living you know in grand forks grand forks isn't a huge metropolitan area by by any means, but as compared to all those little tiny rural towns with a hundred people, two hundred people in, yes, it is. It's it yeah, is very it's much the big city. Completely and, yep, different. Yeah. Yeah, and okay. I've got a very used to being like I, you know, being in Grand Forks. I live out of town, about thirty miles on a, on a farm. So I, 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 I just, I, I can't. That's how I grew up. I grew up in the out in the country, so I, that still just sticks with me. It's where I like to be. But um, those there's those little rural towns around me, like uh, Northwood, um, is kind of far enough away from Grand Forks that they they still have that rural sense of place. Um, but uh, you know, watching those rural rural communities, you know, Thompson, the Thompson's a little bit more of a almost a they, they have their identity. I can know I can hear the Thompson people maybe not liking me 
saying this, but Thompson is kind of a grand, it's like a, it's like a, like a suburb of Grand Forks in a way. I mean, they're just, there's a yeah. lot of people that go back and forth yeah. between Thompson and Grand Forks. Thompson still has that identity, but the further away you get, like really out in those rural areas, they really hold their identities to be ex very, very valuable, something precious to them. Mm -hmm. And that's fun to see. Um, and experience, you know, as far as the museum, because we have a rural arts program, so we take we take exhibitions across the state, and the purpose of our rural arts program is to put exhibitions into those um, uh, more rural areas that where people maybe don't get to have, you know, don't get to Grand Forks or Fargo or Bismarck or, or to have more um, art experiences. So we try to bring it to them. Yeah, and something that they going to them. Oh, it's so much fun because they are so. I mean, there's, they're so grateful and appreciative of that experience. And it's, it's genuine appreciation. They're, they're, they're excited to have us go there. And they're so excited to also share what their community is about. And, it, yeah. and, and, and I love that part of the culture up here. And it definitely influences our baking practices. I mean, you get into these little communities North Dakota is a beautiful, weird, weird state. Yeah, and there's so I much. Like so it. Much going on. Yeah, yeah, I went on um, uh, I my grandma and I we like go on drives sometimes, and we just drove probably half an hour or so out of town, and this little town had um a candy store, and they had just like pounds and pounds of candy, and so like once a year they just get a bunch of candy in, and yeah. then. Uh, I started yeah. talking to the lady and there was this big mural on the, the wall of the store and she's like oh my mom made that and like so there's just so many I guess that's anywhere but like it's interesting in your own backyard to go and kind of engage with like local North Dakotans and kind of learn a little bit more about people it's always fun yeah. absolutely yeah do you remember I can't I know where that candy store is I cannot remember the name of the town now I was gonna I can't remember what it's called either um, I know I, it's just left my mind, but I, our director of the museum goes there to get candy as well. I mean, it's an old fashioned candy store. They get, yep. yeah, yep. once a year, they get this humongous freight load of candy in there. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I haven't been there, but she talks about it. Oh, and it's really it's, cool. Uh, yeah. 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 We went there during COVID. It was like recently, like, oh, I guess like this summer, but time is just going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, time um, is weird right now. Yeah. Because I remember they had um, we had to put gloves on and like you had to be masked and everything. Like I was really surprised like the COVID measures they took too. So that was kind of cool. But yeah, sure. yeah. Well, I guess my dog just came in here again. I guess <laughs> the last question, kind of, are there any um aspects of North Dakota art that you think need more attention on any underrepresented, underappreciated art? I just like to ask that even just for myself, just to kind of know there's something I missed or like something other people may have missed. Um, yeah, I've been thinking about that question. There's kind of there's a lot of ways to approach that. Um, you know, if we're talking about underrepresented, like, uh, you know, right away, my mind goes to indigenous people. You know, they, I mean, they're, the oftentimes that's that's a whole group of people that are that are overlooked um i know at the, the museum we actively uh work to be a, a absolutely inclusive of all the different cultures and cultural representation in, in north dakota but for like underrepresented work you know that's i, I can say that they're That'd be that'd be a way to approach that you know, answering that question. Yeah. Um, I think another way to approach it is, like I mentioned before, all these little um, like these little towns with their unique identities. I think it's I can't I think it's Judd, I think it's just Judd, North Dakota. That's um, its nickname is the City of Murals. Oh so really? The, like the City of Murals. So it made me kind of like okay, this Judd. I know Judd City. You got like thirty buildings in town, so. But then the city of murals. So I had so I had a look. I I, I mean I've 
driven by a Judd. I've never been through a Judd. It's, it has three letters in its name. I mean, it couldn't be a smaller town, but uh, I just recently came across it. I was just kind of looking up like unique things about North Dakota and their city has just gotten together to, I don't know if it's a group of people or there's, if, I'm not sure what, exactly how this thing came to be, but they've got blank walls of abandoned buildings or repurposed buildings or what have you that they don't, they don't want to let those buildings just fall in. And they don't want those buildings also just to be an eyesore for people in Judd because the people of Judd are very proud to be of Judd, right? So there's murals all over the place. There must be 20 to 30 murals in this town. There's more, I mean, it, it's That's incredible. Awesome. And, they're, and they're all local and they're all like, there's, they, there's a round grain bin that they've painted. And um, I mean, it is just this little city of murals on just all <laughs> over the place. And I think that like, like that to me, is yeah, that, little little that's underrepresented. This, yeah, this art. yeah, yeah. It's yeah really just popular. those little towns. I mean, you've got the uh, Enchanted Highway, and that, that you know that gets that gets that gets attention. I've driven down that, right? But you don't, you know, for me being over on the eastern part of the state. Yeah, I love the Enchanted Highway. It's fun to drive to the western part of the state and see that. But also, what about Judd? What about all these little towns that have that have these things to offer? Um, and maybe it isn't, you know, and then we can get into you know, conversations about fine art, folk art, and all that kind of mm -hmm. conversation. But um, I think what is in, is in general underrepresented about North Dakota and partially due to our own kind of Midwestern, uh, maybe overemphasis of humility, we just can't quite stand to be proud of ourselves, is mm -hmm. that we have a lot to be proud of. Yeah, there's, there's a, lot. a lot of there's a there's a there is a rich culture here um, that uh, I, I hope to see to see more of on display. I guess. <laughs> yeah, the more the more I've like done this project and um, just like getting into art the last couple of years more and kind of seeing it more. You don't. It's not something I don't think a lot of people look for, but once you start looking for it, it's all over the place. And so, yeah, exactly. it'll, it'll be fun. Um, I'm just thinking like in the future, like I wanna I wanna go to that Judd place and like check them out. And that sounds really fun, fun road trip. But yeah, and then the indigenous art, I um, actually interviewed um, Hillary Kempnick. Um, she's indigenous artist, um, local. And yeah, we talked a little bit about um, kind of like the art scene. She lived in Winnipeg for a time and um, just hearing how like different places kind of represent um, indigenous artists differently. It's definitely something to think about, like how can Grand Forks in North Dakota in general like, kind of highlight more indigenous artists. And I think we're getting there, but yeah, it's kind of another thing to think about, but yeah, there's a lot, a lot here, in North Dakota, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, the, the um, I've just uh, started out having a conversation with a person at the uh, International Peace Gardens and you know they sit on both sides of the border, so their experience with what Hillary is talking about with just representation, they see both sides. They see the Manitoba mm -hmm. side, the North Dakota side, and it's very different in in uh, well resources and support and exposure and where people are putting their energy. It's not to say one; it's just. Different approaches. There's, there, there, yeah. there's work to be done. Yep. Yeah. Yep. There's 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 just there's ways we can meet together, uh, where maybe one place is done. Uh, we can we can learn from Manitoba, right? And maybe Manitoba mm -hmm. can learn some things from us. But there's more. Yeah. There's definitely th yeah. <laughs> there's more. a lot. A lot of, yeah. There's a lot to be done. Yeah, that's interesting. You bring up um, Peace Gardens. I was actually, uh, I was gonna go on a road trip there recently and i was looking on their website and it's like if you're from canada and you go there so you just drive across the border real quick when you go back you still have to quarantine for two weeks which makes sense but it's like the borders are closed but the peace gardens they'll let you but it's the same quarantine procedure so it's kind of interesting like i wonder yeah, if anyone's taken that up on like oh let's go to the peace gardens and then 
quarantine for two weeks. Yeah. But. We've had, yeah, we have artists that uh, from uh, some uh, artists in Canada who we've had to reschedule their shows because they, they, it's just how it is. The borders, you know, shut down. Yeah. Um, and, uh, or where the, or where the quarantine made, you know, restrictions made it um, just not doable. Yeah. Um, so so it's, it's just, we're just waiting. You know, it's not, if, if there was no other choice, well, then we work with those restrictions. But right now we're just kind of waiting for hopefully things to calm down. Although, um, you know, I don't, I, I don't, uh, COVID isn't going away. Yeah. Like this is, this is just, we're just going to have to learn how to like, this is us adapting to the future. Maybe, maybe eventually someday masks can go away. Maybe, I have no idea, but I'll tell you, COVID's not going away. That's, yeah, that was, <laughs> that, I had a question I was like, curious like how people are thinking about how like art and their art would change post-covid and then someone brought up to me um a minute of it hillary but she's like there's not gonna be a post-covid and i'm like yeah that's true that's true so i changed it to them like when restrictions are lifted but they'll probably always be um certain things that stick so 